item eight, which is a presentation from the House of Bishops on the proposals for the Pastoral Advisory Group on Human Sexuality and the development of the teaching document. That is GS MISC 1158. This is a presentation, Understanding Order 107. Uh, it will be given by the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he will be accompanied by the Bishop of Newcastle and the Bishop of Coventry. They will have up to 20 minutes, and then there'll be a time of questions, and I'll explain how I'm going to run that after the presentation. So can I invite the Archbishop of Canterbury to present, please? Thank you very much. Justin Welby, Canterbury One. The debate in February was a tough and realistic expression of views. We are not alone in this as the Church of England. Every global church Anglican Communion included, is struggling in the same way. In this 500th anniversary of the Reformation, we need to remember that then it was the new technology of printing that spread news and views so fast. Today, the new technologies of IT and tools of social media have the same effect of confronting us with difference and accelerating expressions of opinion often in radicalized ways among series of groups of people who think alike. February demonstrated the need for a fresh approach, and we heard that very clearly, while at the same time ensuring that there is consistency of advice and guidance as we continue to walk together, bearing the burden of our differences, the command of Christ. At the same time, we need to think and act carefully, following the pragmatic Anglican method of approaching controversy through scripture, tradition, and reason, with scripture as our final authority. We promised to keep General Synod informed, the Archbishop of York and myself, in the letter we wrote after February. And this presentation with a lot of time for questions, is an update of what progress has been made. I hope it's as transparent and honest as possible, both about what we hope for and where we have difficulties. And I want to stress that this remains a work in progress. And as we know, as you know, in essence, there are two key steps. A pastoral advisory group chaired by Bishop Christine, uh, and the beginning of work on an Episcopal teaching document, an enormous work chaired by Bishop Christopher. I want to say now how grateful I am to each of them for taking this on and being here now. Thank you very much indeed. And in this presentation, I'm assuming that everyone has read GS MISC 1158. The ways in which the topics on the Episcopal teaching document have been drawn up have three key assumptions. And this also applies as an underlying understanding in the pastoral advisory group. That every person is created in the image of God and is someone for whom Christ lived, died, rose and ascended. This is not primarily about issues or questions, but about people. And people are to be treasured and loved and valued. Second assumption is that those within the Church of England who are engaged in the debates are all concerned to be faithful to the love, truth, mercy, and justice of God and all wish to ensure that the church is faithful to a holy God of love, truth, mercy, and justice. And the third assumption 
is that we must seek to act in a way that reduces fear of each other and of the future. Fear of God is a different category. But we come to these processes as a church with history, not as blank sheets of paper on which to write. As a church, we aspire to be those who worship God in Jesus Christ, caught up in his beauty and his love, filled with the Spirit, joyful together, and also a church that witnesses to that beauty and love that witnesses to our own experience of the goodness of Christ. And most of us agree that these aims are central to whom and what we are as a church, while having diverse perspectives and deep disagreements. We come also with an established doctrine and structures of belief and clear boundaries of acceptability set out in the Declaration of Assent and reflected at the level of the Anglican Communion in the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral, scriptures, creeds, historic episcopacy, and the dominical sacraments. We come also with a long established practice of listening through scripture, read within the life of the church with gifts of reason and understanding, of listening to God, of listening to each other, of listening to the Anglican Communion, and of listening to the wider church, for we retain Catholicity, and to those of other faiths, of no faith, and to society and science, and other sources of knowledge. We, as Anglicans, should not be afraid of engaging with anyone. And in our best moments, that is what we've been like. Listening means what it says. It's often confused with agreeing. I remember a colleague of mine at Coventry Cathedral listening very carefully to someone who had a very lengthy complaint, which ended with, you're not listening to me. And he said, I am listening to you. I'm just not agreeing with you. Listening means paying attention. It means showing that in the way we behave, we deeply value, treasure, and love the person with whom we're engaging. And we come, fourthly, with a tradition of a process of reception. This is, in Church of England terms, quite recent, probably only since the mid-19th century, in which that in listening and in taking time for prof profound theological study and reflection and reflection on the world around us and engaging with each other again and again, we will find God's path in Jesus Christ for the joy and the fulfillment of all people, that they may find the love of Christ and for bringing in the kingdom. We need to remember that across the communion, picking up traditions within the Church of England, we do not have an authoritarian hierarchical structure. We listen we re and we go in for a process of reception. And sometimes that leads to an outcome in which we accept things and sometimes not. And we also have to have realistic expectations of what we are able to do. These two processes have certain aims and means. They aim to take a reasonable time for profound thought by a large number of people across a wide range of views. And during that time to provide pastoral guidance, to map out clearly and with deep thought the areas of agreement and disagreement without assuming reconciliation. This is not intended to produce a document that is the answer. This is intended to map, 
to set out clearly where we agree and where we disagree, to help us understand better the issues and the points of conflict. And it should be a prayerful process. We cannot overstate the importance of that. The whole process of listening, the whole process of reception, is something that we do with God in prayer and that we do before the world around us. We do not talk in a bubble. Others listen and what they hear affects the way in which we witness to Jesus Christ and affects the way in which we live our common life. The pastoral advisory group has, in a sense, the easiest, easier description, but a very complex and difficult role. It is to advise diocese on pastoral issues concerning human sexuality so that we can make our explicit, our commitment to show the love of Christ to all people regardless of sexual or gender identity. And in doing that, it is advice. The autonomy of diocese, the role of senior staff, of bishops, is preserved. But there is a clear intention of enabling the widespread sharing of good pastoral practice and extensive consultation. But let us not imagine that everybody is going to agree with the advice or always do the same thing in different places. There will be a significant level of untidiness. There always is in the Church of England. The Episcopal teaching document picks up the phrase that Bishop Christine quite rightly reminded us yesterday and that is on the screen, and that is so often well filleted. To reflect a radical new Christian inclusion, that word for some reason seems to escape attention quite regularly, founded in scripture, in reason, in tradition, in theology, and the Christian faith as the Church of England has received it. The whole phrase, the whole sentence, clause, whatever it is, I'm not much of a grammar, uh, <coughs> grammar person, um, as you can see. Um, the whole description is essential. Every word in that matters. The working groups, the streams, will be inclusive as far as we are able, especially bearing in mind gender, <clears throat> lay clergy balance, BME, disability, and views and stated understandings on the issues being concerned, but always requiring skills and demonstrated expertise in the relevant area of work. That came out in the questions yesterday. The streams are episcopally led because the ultimate responsibility before God for the teaching of the church in our understanding of episcopacy is entrusted to the bishops who will answer to God for what they do. It aims for, to produce a very large scale document, perhaps with a synthesis, to be available for study and comment across the church in a form suitably digestible and to come to be discussed in this synod, probably in early 2020, though on a process this complicated, we can't be pinned down as to time. And we are seeking to discern, to explore the mind of Christ. There are often comparisons made between our debates and our conclusions on the previous matter of disagreement 
on women in the episcopate or the ordination of women and our debates on human sexuality. There is one parallel, though there are many very, very profound differences. But there is one parallel, that in all the debate and argument, we seek the mind of Christ. Please go back to what I said at the beginning about the assumptions that we start both these processes with. The assumption that all those involved essentially are of good will are Christians seeking what is best for the whole of humanity in the service of Christ and Christ's call to us to reflect his nature and his being. We seek the mind of Christ and we seek his call to know what his call is for us to be able as one church, albeit with disagreements, faithfully to preach and live the good news of Jesus Christ. We are called to unity, not as an alternative to truth or instead of truth or undermining truth. That would be absurd. You cannot possibly have unity, true unity in Christ without truth. And you cannot possibly have truth without unity in Christ. But we are called to unity in the service of mission in the world. This is Jesus' great prayer in John 17. And in a world where diversity and disagreement is almost invariably badly handled. And we are called to preach and live as whole human beings. Whole human beings that, rejo that rejoice in what it is to be human in Christ, to be fully human in Christ. Whole human beings in our sexuality. So that the joy of Christ is seen in our relationships and lives among ourselves and with society and that we may speak confidently in the world around us of wholeness, of repentance, of forgiveness, of love and mercy and justice. I hope it would not be seen as unduly controversial to suggest that the joy of Christ is not invariably seen in our relationships. But we are called to, people, to be a people of joy and love and celebration because of what God has done for us, because of his extraordinary act in reaching out to us, catching us up in his love and bringing us to relationship with himself. And above all, because of that, we preach Christ, God with us, fully human, fully God, incarnate, crucified, risen, ascended, and giving his spirit to the church. We are called to do this as a church of reconciled reconcilers, full of love and joy and peace, growing in God as we think and reflect, as we study and pray, as we relish the love of Christ on which we feast. Thank you. So members of Synod, we have about um, 40 minutes for questions and this is how I would like to do it. If you'd like to ask a question um, at the mo appropriate moment, please stand and I will call you in groups of three. So if you can come and stand at the microphones uh, while the first person is asking their question, that would be great. And then I'll invite the Archbishop and Bishops to answer them and then we'll proceed in that fashion. So if you'd like to ask a question, please stand.
So, yes, we'll have uh, Rosie Harper and Ian Paul and the gentleman at the top there, yes. Rosie Harper, Oxford 190. Archbishop, you said helpfully that the teaching document is not intended to be the answer. I remember that this was said about issues in human sexuality, but it did become quasi-doctrinal, and it has been used especially unpleasantly to control vocations. In what way will you ensure that this new teaching document will not become doctrine through the back door? Archbishop uh, Ian Paul, 227 Southern Nottingham. Uh, your Grace, we're grateful for your clarification and emphasis on the full phrase, radical new Christian inclusion rooted in scripture and those other principles. I think one of the things that some of us have been wrestling with is given the second half of that sentence or clause, we're trying to understand the, the content of the phrase radical new. After all, um, I don't know how many here in the chamber are Jewish, I'm not, and as a result of that, that's a sign that all of us are a fruit of God's radical inclusion. And the churches are the place of diversity and inclusion in our nation. So we're just interested in what the content of that radical newness is. Uh, David Eisen, 54 Deans. At the beginning, Chair, you welcomed the young people as observers here and said they have much to learn. But young people also have much to teach us. And in the list of diversities mentioned by the Archbishop, which included gender and BAME, I didn't include age. I'm wondering what uh, steps the Archbishop will take to make sure that the voices of young people, which are not necessarily conservative or radical, are actually heard in the process by the Synod and by the Church. Hold on, John, I'll call you in a minute. Just a bit of musical chairs here as we compete for who wants to answer the question. <laughs> I have my fingers crossed. <laughs> Thank you, Rosie Harper, for your question. I mean, I think, as the Archbishop said, this is, this is very much a work in progress in terms of how this. Uh, document and whole process evolves. I, I think uh, a key element in that, of course, will be uh, the working streams uh, through the coordination group, the coordinating group, engaging uh, with um, the rest of the uh, Episcopal team, the, the College of Bishops indeed, and uh, especially the House, uh, to see exactly what form of teaching document do we want? Do we want a, a teaching document that teaches people to think well? Um, or do we want, at the same time, uh, a teaching document that um, identifies and rejoices in the teaching of the church? Uh, and I, I think it's that there, there's a balance to be had there in terms of how the, uh, the House of Bishops and the College of Bishops more widely wants to use this document and the resources uh, that it will be uh, bringing to the fore. Our doctrine is uh, set by our uh, fundamental uh, sources of authority uh, and the Archbishop has uh, defined those well. Uh, the priority, of course, in our sources is given to Scripture. Uh, the work here will be uh, engaging uh, with scripture, engaging uh, with our uh, definitions of doctrine in order uh, to um, examine those uh, in uh, present conditions and then to work with the house and the college uh, to see uh, where it wants to sort of place it, how it wants to use that, um, 
uh, that work in terms of, well, uh, this is the teaching that we teach, this is where we want people to think well and think further. brief thought and thanks to Dr. Ian Paul for his question. And the fourth um, term of reference for the pastoral advisory group is indeed to explore together and hear from others what radical Christian inclusion founded in scripture in reason, tradition and theology and uh, the Christian faith as the Church of England has received it might mean in the life and mission of the church. Um, clearly the focus of the pastoral advisory group is pastoral action but we can't divorce and we will not divorce pastoral action from theology because it, it's, it's clear that we can, uh, everything needs to be rooted in our understanding of God and God's purposes for humankind. But as you asked that question, Dr. Ian Paul, I thought of Paul, Dr. Paula Gooder, if she'd been here. And many of you would have benefited from um, her enthusiasm for two Corinthians and heard her say, in Christ, new creation which is her translation of that. And I think uh, certainly uh, in my heart is something of exploring the depth of what that might mean, deeply rooted in Christ and in scripture. And uh, on the question of age, my apologies to the group to my right. I should have included age as something that we bear in mind, but it always includes, David, and thank you for the question, it always includes um, the proviso that people come with a particular contribution of expertise that uh, they can contribute to the process. Uh, John Dunnett, uh, Sarah Tupling, and yes, you, madam. Uh, John Dunnett, Chelmsford 81. Thank you very much, Archbishop, for your introduction and for the enormous work um, already gone into set up um, this um, process. Um, uh, like one of the previous questioners, um, I would be one who doesn't like doctrine by the back door. Um, so I wonder whether it could be clarified for us whether the intent here is to offer a front door. Uh, and by that I mean not just um, a guide, uh, as in some issues, not just a report, as in pilling, but a teaching document uh, more akin to GS 2055 um, that clarifies and confirms for us what it is that the Church of England um, preaches and teaches in these important areas. Thank you. Good morning. Sarah Topling. Number 471, one of the three um, deaf Anglican together reps. Thank you very much to the Archbishop of Canterbury for his very clear explanation and for the document from the House of Bishops. I just want to ask about the people who will be involved in this process. Um, you mentioned disabled people. I just want to check whether there have been deaf and disabled people identified to be involved. And as one of the other speakers has said, what about the young people? My question is, what about the deaf people too? So um, in the last group of sessions, my colleague um, spoke about the various minority groups, for example, BME groups. And I just want to make sure that suitable consideration has been given to that within the groups that are being constructed. Thank you. Joyce Hill, 326 Leeds. I have one very simple question. Are the bishops 
sufficiently aware of the urgency of this issue. The issue is one which is of great importance to the nation, great importance to the relationship between the Church of England and the nation. And though as an academic, I'm very, very aware indeed of the need to investigate thoroughly, I am very concerned that there's a lot of long grass potentially growing in the program that is being put before us. And your question? And so my question was the one I posed at the beginning. Are the bishops sufficiently aware of the urgency of this matter? And I would ask that they do not let the long grass grow. Uh, thank you to, to John Dunner for, for your question. I think it's rather, uh, I mean, in a sense, my uh, answer is rather similar to, to the reply to um, Rosie Harper, that uh, to an extent it depends how the House of Bishops and the College of Bishops wants to work with the, uh, uh, the material and the thinking that we produce. Uh, I, I suppose, I mean, it is, as I say, a very much a work in process. An image, in, in my mind, I don't know whether I'll sort of keep to this image, but I think it's sort of helping me at this point is, I think uh, the first task of those groups, and this will be, um, I think, uh, a role for the coordination group to say to the, uh, uh, to the different streams, we want you to do, to do some mapping, as the Archbishop has said, and, and, and that begins with setting out some coordinates, you know, uh, wh where are the views? Um, uh, uh, what, 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 what are the uh, perspectives, the theological perspectives, the historical perspectives, the social uh, perspectives, and, um, uh, and, and, and why are they there? You know, what, what are the deep roots of them? Can we really understand them? Can we really understand each other? And, and then I think there's a, there's a sort of, um, through, through that uh, coordination exercise, uh, setting out the coordinates, um, one begins to see where, as it were, the land masses are. Uh, where, where is the common ground um, on which we stand? And what, what are the foundations of, of that? And I would hope that would be pretty large, really. Uh, you know, we, we have uh, deep uh, Trinitarian, incarnational uh, understandings of God, which gives us deep uh, understandings of humanity and the way... Uh, society works. So there's a huge amount, I would hope, of, of common ground. But no doubt we will find there are some sort of islands, as it were, uh, that are there, uh, which, are, which look to be a fair way apart. Uh, I, I would hope we would do some thinking about, well, what sort of bridges can be built between those. Um, and then I think it would be uh, reasonable for um, uh, as, as we engage together, particularly as the bishops engage together in this process and engage, engage with our Episcopal College, um, Episcopal colleagues, uh, where, um, what sort of direction uh, do we navigate around uh, these land masses? Uh, which ones, as it were, can we see uh, belong to uh, the continent, if I could put it that way? of one church. There are certain boundaries, as the Archbishop has said, uh, which uh, are uh, determined um, by fundamental Christian positions as articulated in our sources of authority. So those sort of questions are going to be faced. Uh, but I would hope very much that the, the bishops will be able to articulate some really uh, powerful um, uh, common ground in which we rejoice 
uh, together. Uh, having done some really hard thinking, having interrogated our, uh, our, our doctrine uh, in this present uh, situation, um, and would also be able to say, well, there are some areas where uh, there is real disagreement and um, either further thinking is needing to be done or there are some clear decisions which need to be made about certain uh, understandings. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah, for your question on the really important issue of disability. I think our response here from the House of Bishops is very much rooted in um, that uh, which at the heart of the partial advisory group, but also in the teaching document actually, because it's a theological statement, is making explicit our commitment to show the love of Christ to all people, regardless of sexual or gender identity, and to go beyond that to all the things by which we have a human tendency to categorize people and judge people without actually taking on board the whole humanity of somebody. So, to be quite blunt, this may be a bit provocative, but uh, throughout history, uh, well, certainly in our recent history and in England, if you haven't been a well-educated white male, um, other groups have been seen in um, certain respects as having less authority uh, in, and credibility in, in what they say. And so women, BME people, uh, uh, LGBTI people, disabled people have all been seen in some ways just a bit defective off the norm, the ideal, if you like. And our po po point here is to absolutely acknowledge the wonderful preciousness and authority and credibility and truly representative nature of every human being, regardless of all those other factors by which I think it's original sin, we categorize each other. So on the question of people in the groups, we'll be looking at the composition of our groups but we will be choosing the very best people, as far as we can see it, to contribute to the work. And we will not allow issues such as sexual identity, gender identity, disability, to stop us seeing the worth of those people. So the best academic in the field, for example, in theology, may well have a disability. We may not know that when we choose them. We choose them because of who they are. The disability should not define people. And we must be really careful, I and mean, it's this back to this unconscious bias thing, that we don't unconsciously write people off um, in one or other regard because they're not quite like who I see myself as I am. So really important question, and I think we need to keep staying, being challenged by it all the time. Uh, Thank you, Joyce, for the question about are we sufficiently aware as bishops of the need for urgency. Uh, views on whether we are sufficiently aware will differ uh, across synod and across the church. There are many people who think uh, that this should take a lot longer, and there are many people who think that we should come to a quick decision now and get it over and done with. Um, I think all of us uh, would like if there was a magic wand to be able to wave it and have a sort of solution. Um, there is no magic wand. If you look at the, uh, the paper, you will see that the timetable is set out, uh, I think, on page six. Uh, and we believe very firmly that a time scale of two and a half to three years both does justice to the depth and range of the questions that need to be addressed, which are profound and extraordinarily difficult questions, and to the need to begin to draw some conclusions for the church. Begin. Um, this clearly will not satisfy everyone, but already to do a document of this size in such a time is a remarkably short period to attempt such a process, which is why we are working it 
in a series of concurrent different work streams rather than one group trying to do the whole thing uh, sequentially, which would take far longer. So are we sufficiently aware? We are aware that there is urgency, but we are also aware that there is a huge importance to sustained and serious theological consideration, including very careful listening to different voices and perspectives before views are formulated. That uh, Bishop Graham James spoke very eloquently of this in his speech in the February debate, looking back at the history on this issue and on other issues. And I'd refer you to that speech uh, for a masterful uh, presentation of the need for proper reflection and reception. Uh, Dagmar Winter, uh, lady at the very back. Martin Sewell. Dagmar Winter, Newcastle 178. Regarding the Episcopal teaching document here, uh, Dr. Jessica Martin wrote a remarkable uh, theological framework, I thought, for the uh, long since forgotten Pilling Report. Um, and I'm hoping and wondering, and therefore phrasing it as a question, whether this document uh, could be uh, used to inform and um, inspire uh, the, uh, the Episcopal teaching document, and whether she may also be asked to be a contributor. Thank you. Um, Hannah Gravel, Derby 297. Off the back of Rosie's question, would you consider, along with the Ministry Division, advising diocesan directors of ordinance to stop using issues in human sexuality in the discernment process of new ordinance until a new teaching document is available, given that it was never intended for use in this way and that it is 26 years old? Martin Sewell, Rochester 391. Your Grace, one of the greatest areas of difficulty is paradox. And when you were answering the question about the young people, we threw up another paradox, because quite rightly, and this isn't going to be an easy question to answer, you said, well, we want young people, but they have to have proven expertise and, and something to contribute. Your question. Well, my question is, if you are young, how can you produce that expertise? You don't have 25 years in parish ministry and 14 books to your name. But you, the great thing is, you have the experience of what it's like to be young, which Mr. most of us have Sewell, can I ask you, just simply in a sentence, to put your question and stop making a speech? How can you resolve that paradox? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to Dagmar Winter. Uh, yes, that was a, a fine essay by Jessica Martin. There's, there's a whole lot of really good material out there. And although this project does feel pretty daunting, um, it's hugely exciting. I mean, there, there's some great material to engage with, some great people to I engage with. I don't think it's right for me to get drawn into uh, comments about particular names. Um, as the Archbishop has said, we're, we're, we're still forming uh, the groups. Uh, there's a real need to get the right balance, but also the right expertise. I don't think it would be helpful for me to get into, I, into names, but certainly uh, we need to draw really widely and very deeply on the, on the uh, extensive uh, resources uh, that, that are out there. And of course the groups are not bound, and in fact the, the, the G.S. Smith's document uh, reminds the groups that they are to, uh, to seek views beyond uh, their own membership, as it were. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, for a typically um, spot-on question. 
As a sponsoring bishop uh, in my diocese, this is one of the questions that I would like to put to our group, the pastoral advisory group, to have a look at uh, the questions that we ask to those coming forward as exploring um, vocation. And uh, we obviously, in our pastoral advisory group, do not have uh, any authority to change the doctrine of the Church of England, but to look at how we, uh, what kind of questions we ask consistent with that doctrine, I think will be one of our tasks that we will need to address with some urgency. Thank you, Martin. Um, I was aware of the paradox when I was saying it. It hadn't escaped me. Um, how do we resolve it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's probably the most honest answer. Uh, we obviously have, as, as Chris, Bishop Christopher just said, we seek views beyond the membership of the groups. We bring people in. You often appoint people sometimes for what you think they will, for potential as much as for expertise in particular areas. And, but we will bear the issue in mind. And I know it's a paradox. And uh, what is clear is none of these groups, as we... I think I said in answer to a question yesterday, there is not going to be a sort of proportionate representation of all possible views, ages, sorts, types, backgrounds within the church. Um, that's just not possible without having, I don't know, hundreds of people in each, in each working stream. But we will do our best to be as representative as inclusive as we are able. Thank you. Uh, Simon Butler, the gentleman there, and uh, Father Thomas Seville. Thank you, Chair. Simon Butler, Southwark 219. Uh, as we begin any major process like this, um, we need to be careful about our terms, and particularly the term teaching, I think, is one that will probably have many different understandings in this room. So a question about pedagogy is quite important at the outset if we're going to know where we're going. I wonder whether it will be helpful to the bishops and to the church whether we ought to think of a learning and teaching document rather than a teaching document, because education is part of what this process is about, as well as telling us the mind of the bishops. Paul Hutchinson, 243 York. Uh, last night I asked the Bishop of Peterborough a question about the time scale in the conversations with the Methodist Church and that the, the uh, time scale in, in those conversations and the work to be done is remarkably similar to the time scale we have uh, on this report. And my question is, um, is the work we're doing here going to be keeping an eye on, on the state and continuing state of deliberations in the Methodist Church and, and what they're saying, and are we giving any particular priority to uh, Methodist deliberations over against other ecumenical considerations, given the work that we're doing towards uh, recognition of ministries there? Thomas Seville, 446, Religious Communities. Um, I have a question regarding the thematic working groups. Um, uh, there may be very good reasons for why this area is absent from them, um, and I wait for enlightenment on that. Um, but I note that there is nothing dealing with um, the moral theological aspect of these um, issues. Um, and I look forward to hearing for uh, um, an account of where that area will figure in uh, these deliberations. Simon, thank you very much. I suspect, I mean, that inevitably this process will be one of learning as well as of teaching, and hopefully learning for the whole church and an interactive 
process and that, that will go on. I bear the point in mind that I just go back to what I said in the presentation, that in the end, the responsibility for doctrine in an Episcopal church lies within the Episcopate. And, and we have to, we have that responsibility for better or worse. Um, and Paul, in terms of time scale, um, we weren't giving particular thought to the, uh, you know, I should have thought of it and I'm grateful to you for pointing it out. I hadn't sort of noticed, oh, there you are. I hadn't noticed the parallel. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Um, I think I made the point about Catholicity very carefully, that we will be engaging with a number of other churches, not just the Methodist one. We won't be giving particular priority to that, but we will be trying to bear in mind what is going on uh, around the whole church as we go forward in this. But thank you for that observation. So, uh, thank you, Chair. Founder Thomas, uh, yes, moral philosophy, uh, moral theology will be very much part of, of the work, uh, I, I think, running through the whole process. But it is particularly there in that theological stream. Uh, I think the GS document does, it does refer to dogmatics and ethics to be, uh, as the two particular disciplines to be covered. So, yeah, I, I can ensure you, Father, that that will be very much uh, built in, particularly to that work. But, of course... Uh, ethical considerations will, will, will run across uh, them all and moral reasoning. So thank you. Uh, members of Synod, I'm going to try and squeeze two more questions in. So these will be the last two. Uh, we'll have Jane Sharman and uh, the gentleman there in the pink striped shirt. Jane Charman, uh, Salisbury 211. Uh, could I ask what arrangements the House of Bishops is making uh, to consult with and learn from a sister province, the, the Scottish Episcopal Church, which has recently brought its own uh, deliberations on this matter to a conclusion. I had uh, the privilege of being the Church of England's representative to their uh, Jane, general Jane, we, we're running short of time, so could just sure do thing. the question? Just wanted to say I thought we had much, much to learn from their approach, and I'd be glad to hear that we're going to consult with them. Mark Bratton, Coventry 100. Why isn't experience included amongst the sources of authority that you'll consider when you're putting this document together? Um, surely it is the experience, the visceral experience, of those who have found the church's inherited position a burden too hard to bear that has impressed this issue on the mind of Synod. Um, it seems to me it's very easy for the Bible, tradition, and reason to become algorithms uh, providing slot machine answers. Sorry, uh, it's becoming a speech. I rest my case. Uh, <laughs> the, very yeah, quickly, please. The, the question, why isn't experience uh, included as a discrete factor? Thank you. Jane, thank you very much about the question of SEC. I think I saw you somewhere over there. Um, oh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much about the Scottish Episcopal Church question. Uh, we will certainly be seeking to learn from all the provinces of the Anglican Communion. Um, one might also consider Canada, which is in a similar 
time and place at the moment, uh, New Zealand, Australia, many others that have been considering this question, uh, and other provinces that have taken a different view. But they will, it, they will all be learned from. There is a lot to learn from the experience around the communion in many different areas, and we will be seeking to do so very carefully. Thank you for the reminder. And of course, with John Arms here, it's uh, particularly appropriate. Thank you. Thank you to Mark Breton for your question. Very glad that Coventry Diocese is taking us into theological method. I think, well, I mean, you know, we get th this is where it gets fun, isn't it, really? And, and this will be uh, work for the groups to do. Uh, how, what is our theological method? Uh, and uh, it's certainly not a slot machine. Uh, and I think my worry with the way you put it, Mark, is that it sounds like, well, we just, I don't know, we just, there's just another sort of um, uh, lever to, uh, to pull. Um, the config, how we configure um, scripture, uh, tradition, and reason is really important. It can sound like a, a very crude three-legged stool. That's never what it's uh, meant to have been. There's a, 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 a clear uh, uh, configuration uh, that is necessary in the relationship uh, between those three. And as we... Um, as we handle scripture in the living tradition of the church with uh, the God-given gifts of reason and understanding, we are always engaging with experience. There's no way of, uh, of, of doing theology without engaging with real lived experience. Um, so, I, I mean, we can have a discussion about is it a discrete area? I, I don't think it is. It is. You know, it, it's the air that we breathe. This is, this is where we do our theology. And, and it only has credibility if we're doing it um, in uh, this situation uh, in human history. With all, it's, you know, this is our missionary environment. This, this, is our, this is the situation in which God has placed us to do uh, our theology. So, you know, it, uh, it, it, um, it's, it's just, it just happens. Thank you. So that uh, concludes this item. May I thank on your behalf the Archbishop and the Bishops of Coventry and Newcastle for their presentation and the way in which they've answered the questions, uh, which we will now proceed to item nine.